Good morning, good morning, good morning. Man, what a beautiful day in the Lord it is. Just a great day. Easter's next Sunday. Things just can't get much better. Amen? It's good to see you here this morning. We come and it's time to celebration of Easter and the resurrection of Jesus. Good Friday is coming up this, this, this week. We focus on the death and the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be sharing in communion together. And uh, again, let me reiterate for those who may be guests of ours today, we don't celebrate what's called closed communion. And in other words, if you know the Lord, uh, whether you're a member of this church or not, if you, Christ is your Lord and Savior and your heart is right, you feel free to participate in our communion service today when it is served to the whole congregation. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. More than anything else, when you come to Believer's Fellowship, our desire is to see that, uh, more than anything else, that God just touches your heart and touches your life, and you walk out of here knowing that you have somehow sensed the presence of the Lord. So even as we sing this song, let us become more aware of your presence. That's, uh, that's our prayer. Because I know with all my heart, if we just get a glimpse of Jesus... Here in this place today, our lives are changed. That's all it takes. It's just a glimpse of the Lord. So we're glad you're here to worship and hope that you do sense the presence of the Lord in this place. As we celebrate communion uh, today, this follows up a message that I did last week called the Passover Lamb. And we looked at a little bit of the Passover and uh, specifically talking about the Lamb and how he was slain for, our, for, for the sins of, of the nation of Israel and while they were in Egypt. We talked about that the true Passover Lamb, all that was... Yes, it was in reality, and it had application for them as it spoke of their deliverance from the Egyptians and the, and the covenant of God that would be fulfilled in their life. But also we know that it was a prophetic event for us as well, that there would be a lamb who would come, who would be the true lamb of God. Even John the Baptist declared, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we knew that there would be, you know, in the context of that prophetically, that we see this fulfillment, and that is Jesus in the fulfillment. Is your lamb and my lamb. And praise the Lord for that. I want to focus a little bit more on the Lord Jesus today because remember what Scripture says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of, of me because he is the Lamb of God. Now, we don't do the Lord's Supper as often as some congregations do. We do it pretty much quarterly around here that we take the time. And, and when we do take the time to do that, we take the whole service for that. We, I don't believe it ought to be something we add on to the service. It should be our celebration time. And what better time than this time of year? Now, biblically, if you want to follow that pattern, because people always say, well, how often should we do it as a church? We do it every Sunday, should we do it more often? Biblically, as a pattern, it's done once a year. That's Passover. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, talking about Passover and the Seder and, and the elements from it, celebrating this new remembrance meal, it was at least once a year, amen? But we're not under law, and, and there's no specific guideline following that for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we do it as often as we feel the Lord would have us do that and celebrate this time of communion together. But we want to do it with the hearts that are right and our minds that are right and, and our lives that are right with God today. So as we focus on the Lord Jesus, it also has a tendency to cause us to focus a bit on our own lives and our, and our own situation. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 today, and I'd encourage you to stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God as we look at this. For he says, I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed, that the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it in pieces and he passed it to the disciples and he said, this is my body or represents my body, which is being given for you. When you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, the cup of wine after the supper and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by my shed blood. Each time you drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. And then he went on to say, for every time you eat and you drink of this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes. So here is a time of remembrance as we look at this today. You may be seated. It's to remember, he says, but not just remember anything. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So I want to just focus on the whole concept and the whole idea this morning of remembering and what it really does mean to remember. You say, well, I, I remember. But we're, this word is used in a much deeper fashion in this passage of Scripture, uh, scripture than just to call something to mind again. You know, well, I, I remember that. Well, yeah, I, I remember what, no. I want us to really focus on what the whole idea here. And the idea is more than just to recall something that happened in a past event in the history of your life or in history itself. This remembering, if you look at the actual Greek words of this and on into the Hebrew renderings of it, it is a word which really means to stir up your mind, to relive this in your heart and mind, to go back in your mind as, as Scripture reveals it to us and recall what this event is really about. It's not just a casual call to mind or remember something or think about it or take a note on it. The idea goes much, much deeper. 
where we're really taking the time. So, so this morning as we receive the Lord's Supper and as we're remembering the Lord Jesus, I really want us to put everything else out of our minds this morning. I uh, just forget about, you know, uh, uh, anything else going in this room except this moment of, of remembrance of the Lord. We're not here to focus on anything anyway, anytime we do come here, but the Lord Jesus. But specifically, as we take this covenant, this meal together, this communion time together, let's get our hearts and our minds set on things above and not on things below. It's not important what anybody on the stage is wearing or what your neighbor's got on or not. All right? It's not important what hairstyles are out there today in which hairstyles are not really styles. <laughs> or are not really hair, okay? <laughs> We're here to put our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. So mentally, just to kind of get some things arranged in your mind today as we take the time to observe this memorial meal together and remember how holy it is and all that it really represents for our lives and, and, and the testimony of our lives. So in verse 26, when he tells us that we do these things, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. Let's remember that today. And let's remember even as we receive this together. In fact, let's just walk through a few things the Lord, I think, has in mind for us when it says remember. The first and most important thing is remember who he is. Who are we talking about here? We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about God's special lamb. The lamb that was represented in the Passover hundreds of hundreds of years before this. That a lamb had to be taken. He had to be a, 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 a young lamb. He had to have you know, no blemishes. He had to be pure. He couldn't have any diseases. He had to be taken. He had to come under examination for four days to make sure that he was a spotless lamb, that he was clean, that he was an acceptable sacrifice. We saw that last week when we talked about Jesus, that Jesus Christ is that lamb, all right, that he's taken for you and he gave his life for you. And this is who we're talking about. But I, I want you to back it up a little bit. Let's, let's take this lamb of God pre-becoming a man. This is God's son who has been God's son from eternity past. Jesus just didn't get thought up in the mind of God about the time we needed a savior and God creates Jesus, all right? Jesus has been with God everlasting in eternity from since time before time and all of eternity past to all eternity future. He is God. He is the son of God. He's God's special gift to us. If you look at him, he steps out of heaven he doesn't, I've heard people say, well, he lays aside his glory. Jesus never laid aside his glory. He veiled his glory. He, he clothed it with human flesh and he became a man. And he was born of a virgin. And he's born and he lived to the age of 30 and enters into the ministry that God had given to him, destined for one place, and that was to the cross and ultimately to the grave and to the resurrection on our behalf. That's Jesus. He is the eternal glory of God is in him. And he has ever bit God as he is man, all right? So he comes. But listen to what he, in Scripture describes Jesus as today as we take, think about him. Remember, he is called the way, the what? And the life. He's the way, he's the truth, and the life. But let's not stop there because if you just follow some of the things that are making reference to Jesus in Scripture, you come up with other things like he is the door, he is the gate, he is the shepherd. Not only is he the shepherd, he's the good shepherd. Not only does Scripture refer to him as shepherd, good shepherd, he's also the chief shepherd over all shepherds. He is the word of God. He is the living word of God. He is the alpha, the beginning. He is the omega, the end. He is the one who says all things come from him and all things go through him and all things are going to him. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is called the king, but not only is he referred to as the king, he is the king of kings. Not only is he the Lord, he's the Lord of the Lord. He's the Lord of Lords. Amen. He's the Lord of Lords. That, that's worth getting excited about. Hey, this ain't the rodeo. And you go down the rodeo and watch somebody on a rotating stage at the rodeo and you're just, I get an autograph. You can get excited about something that means nothing in the context of eternity. But this is the Lord of Lords. This is the King of glory. He's the Lord of all things. He's also referred to as your master, your savior, your defender, your shield, your deliverer, your prince, the prince of peace. He's called the son of God. He's called the son of David. He's called the son of man. He is the Lord of glory. He is our counselor. He is the true vine. He is the resurrection. He is Emmanuel. He is Messiah. He is redeemer. 
He is Jesus. That's who we're remembering today. So I, you think, I don't know if I got that much room up here. All right. Just get as much of that as you can today. When we are talking today about the sacrifice for our sins, we're talking about the greatest price, the most valuable treasure that could ever be given for your redemption was given. And when, we, when he says, remember me, we should remember who he is and the fullness of all that he is. So as we take the Lord's Supper today and remember who he is, let's remember just exactly who he is. And he's my Savior. My Lord, my Savior. But not only do we remember who he is, let's remember exactly what he did. Let's back it up a little bit. He steps out of the kingdom of heaven. He leaves the kingdom of heaven. He takes on human form. He becomes a man. He's born in a nasty stable, a barn, if you want to put it more properly. Not, this is not the Hyatt, all right? Nor is it the, the nurturing ward down at Memorial Hospital, all right? It's not the Texas Children's Hospital in the most sanitary of conditions. He's born in a dirty stable, and they place him in a hay trough. That's a plate for animals, all right? That's a food trough. Well, he is our bread of life, amen? And he comes born in these filthy conditions, for us, he becomes a man. And what a change of environment. Amen? Yeah. And he comes and he's placed there and he grows into this man of, who is true man. He's all man, yet he's still God. He's tested, he's tried, he's examined just like the lamb was for you and it's found that there is no blemish in him. That pagan by the name of Pontius Pilate put it correctly. <laughs> I find no fault in him because there isn't any fault in Jesus. He comes, and remember, he, he not only born of man, he, 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 he becomes a man, and now he comes and he offers his life as the spotless lamb. What he does for us, he comes to the cross, voluntarily, willingly, not resisting it, moving forward, his face set like a flint on Jerusalem, it says in those last days, as he's moving towards Calvary, and he's doing this for us. And what is he doing? He's coming to lay down his life. He's coming to take your place and my place at the cross and on the cross. The Bible says this about him. What he did was, he who knew no sin became sin. I mean, think about that. He who knew no sin became sin. Not just my sin, and that's bad enough, by the way, all right? And not just your sin, that's pretty bad too. But the Bible says he not only died for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. All the sin of all humanity from the garden to the last days has been paid for by Jesus Christ. Will all men accept it? No. But it has been done, praise the Lord. It's all been paid for. He comes, he suffers through the mock trials, the humiliation of the Sanhedrin, the scribes, the Pharisees, through the mock trials of Herod and, and Pontius Pilate. He stands before these people as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and humbly closes his mouth because he knows that he's come to die for our sins, the sins of the whole world. He takes your place. He takes my place. So when I remember today in taking communion, it reminds me, he paid the price for my sins. He shed his blood. He, he, he went to the cross. The nails should have been mine. The crown should have been mine. The spear in his side, the whip on his back, it should have been mine. He who knew no sin though, without sin, he becomes my sin and literally takes the judgment of sin upon himself. That's, uh, this, is the, this is the Lord Jesus who's come to do this for me and who's come to do this for you, he sheds his blood so that you could be redeemed. The price had to be paid. You can't be saved. There's no way you'll ever get to heaven. There's no way you'll know peace here on earth in the midst of all the hell that rages around us. There's no place for peace in your life until you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there he comes and there he stands and there he goes to Calvary and there he lays down his life from us. No man takes my life from me, he says. I give it freely. He goes to die, and he dies. And on the cross, he cries, it is finished. But it's not finished in that regard. The price to be paid is finished, but he's not done. <laughs> he's going to be raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father on the third day. And he's going to conquer death, conquer the grave, and conquer hell. 
on our behalf. And by doing that, it's the stamp of God's approval upon his sacrifice, number one. But number two, it gives us now the right and the privilege to join him and follow him through death, hell, and the grave and become victorious in our lives as well. This is, what, this is Jesus. This is what he's done for you. He ascends to the Father after 40 days of being with his disciples and instructing them and giving their, giving their mission clarity. And then he leaves and says, I'll return. Even the communion, as you follow it recorded in Scripture, Jesus makes reference to receiving this again with them in heaven. There's going to become another day where we'll sit down with the Lord Jesus Christ and have a fellowship meal together. And we'll do what? We'll remember him corporately with all the saints of ages past. What a moment. You say, well, how's that possible? Who knows? I'm not God. I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I don't have to worry about the seating. <laughs> Clean up before or after either way. Amen. <laughs> He's got it taken care of. It's all done. And so not only are we looking back as we remember what he did, we're looking forward to what he's going to do. Amen. But let's remember that what, what he did was very specific and it relates to each and every one of us. But not only that, remember why he did it. The Bible says, for God so That is so good. Y'all give yourself a hand. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this sounds good when it's done corporately in unison like that. Amen. That's the power of God. I want you to know when you, when you were saying that demons were trembling. All right. Somebody was getting bothered too probably in here as well. Hey, he came and he gave his only begotten son because he loved us. Because he loved humanity. He took Adam and formed him out of the dust of the ground and took from Adam aside his rib, a rib and made Eve with it. And out of that comes all of humanity. And God loves every human who's ever been born from Adam on. And praise God, that includes you and that includes me. God loves humanity. God so loved the world. That's just phenomenal. How much does God love the world? The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What a powerful message of love. What a powerful message of love for humanity. How much does God care about people enough to die for them? I, I, I'm always upset with these people who get on the TV and go, where was God when that happened? And where was God when that happened? Y'all have all heard that. Every time there's a crisis, where was God? My question back is, where was God when, you know, the first murder happened? He was present. He saw it happen. He was not pleased about it. But he gave you the ability to make a choice. And when you fail to choose, you're not going to be able to blame God for your failures. When you choose to fail instead of choose to live and choose to have victory, that, that's on you. God's made it possible for you to have victory. But mankind continues to show their human sinful nature. Oh, and that's why we'll keep having those kind of events that we experience often until Jesus comes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Remember, he did it because he loved us. And we demonstrate as men and, and humanity all the time why we're so unlovable. <laughs> but he loved us anyway. But not just humanity. Let's bring it a little closer. You know, look around this room just for a second. All right, look, look at that person sitting next to you. Just, they, they won't be too scared. God loves that person. When you go home and you're driving up down your street and you pull in your neighborhood and you go past the houses you go by, I want you to remember God loves everybody in every one of those houses you'll drive by. Amen. You may not like them, <laughs> but God loves them. Amen. You may be upset the way they do it, but God loves them. And all too often, we're willing to just celebrate the fact, God loves the world, amen. But that doesn't mean my neighbor or my husband. <laughs> yes, it does. And God expects you to love them with the same love. Amen. He paid the price so that we could have that kind of love in our life. God said, but catch this, let's move in a little tighter circle. Humanity, then my neighbor, this may surprise you even, even though you have it up here, you had not got it here. God loves you. Oh, Brother Joe, you know, I'm a mess. God loves you. Uh, you know what I did this week? God loves you. I uh, just, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of a jerk. I really failed. I made a mess over here. I, if I look back on my life, I see so many, so many mistakes. God loves you. Can you just let that saturate for a moment? God loves me. And Satan's always trying to convince me that God doesn't, by the way. It's the same thing. He, he sees the same thing with Adam and Eve in the garden. Oh, has God said, does God really care? You know, you, you, God just wants God to kind of keep something back for you. That's all lies. And God's demonstrated clearly his love for you. How did he do that? 
He sent his son to die on the cross for all humanity. And you are involved in that picture. All right. And why did he do it? Out of love. It is also because of sin had to be atoned for. We could never walk with God. Once man sinned, we were cut off. But God is seeking to restore that fellowship and that communion of heart with him. He's seeking to restore that relationship with you. And so his love drove him to die for your sin. He did it for you, your neighbors, the people around you, the people you work with, the people you'll drive by on the street today. But remember, he loves you today. And if anything else, you get out of this Lord's Supper day, when you take that cup of communion and you take that piece of unleavened bread, you remember that he gave all that for you. He gave his body, he gave his blood because he loves you. And when you start hearing little things in your head and your heart that say he doesn't care, he's not concerned, he's not near, he doesn't know, that's all lies straight out of hell. Amen. And you're going to have to embrace the truth. But I want you to remember when he did it. You say, what do you mean remember when he did it? I know when he did it, 2,000 plus years ago. Let me get my calculator, I'll give you the exact date. Hey, when he did it, that's, yes, it's been a t- long time ago, but it's universal. But I want you to remember, let's, let's personalize that. When did he save you? Has that ever happened? All right. Has you ever had a personal decision to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Jesus makes it clear we have to make a choice. If any man will come after me, he says, let him come. In other words, there's an act where you decide no longer follow yourself, but you come. You start following Christ. What is a Christian? It's a Christ follower. All right. It's a disciple, somebody who follows the Lord Jesus Christ. When did that happen in your life? I remember clearly when it happened to me. All right. I, in fact, I, I got the date down even, September 27, 1973. I know that seems like a long time ago. It's just yesterday to me. I clearly remember it in my head. In fact, let me just give you a moment. I don't often encourage you to do this, but let me encourage you to do something. Let your mind wander just for a moment back to when it was for you. Can you go back to that time when Christ became real to you and Jesus became part of your life? Go back to that place that... Go back to that time, day, night, noon, who knows? People get saved all different times, amen? Go back to that location. It might have been in church. It might have been in a crusade. It might have been a revival. It might have been in your house. I know a guy got saved on a surfboard. I know another guy got saved in a phone booth. <laughs> you can get saved anywhere. You can get saved here today. <laughs> you, can, can you go back there? Some of you are there because you're smiling already. Some of you are crying. That's good. <laughs> it's good to remember that moment of when what he did who did it, and when he did it in your life. I remember it. Now, you may not have the date down, you know. Uh, Somebody told me, hey, what you ought to do today is write this down in your Bible, this date you gave your life to Jesus Christ. Therefore, I've had that date. I don't know if I'd remember it now, if it was September, October, all right, or if I remember it's the 27th or the 30th, or if I remember if it was exactly that year. The older I get, some of that starts fading, but not this. (laughs) But I can't tell you. I've been guilty of missing my anniversary by day. You know, uh, there's been this. We got married on Mother's Day, which doesn't always stay the same. That's really messed me up. All right. Because some one year it might be on the 8th. The next year, I think this year it's on the 12th. You know, you know, and it's, it's some years it's on the 10th and the 11th. So uh, I've, I've had a tendency to forget that. I have my excuses. But one thing I don't forget I'm married. And I remember the day I got married. I remember standing at the front of that altar, watching her come in with her daddy with that look on his face, like, I'm going to kill you if you mess this up. (laughs) You know, I I remember that day. I remember taking her hand. I remember the vows. You know, I can hear the songs in the background. And when I I step and think about it, I can look out in the crowd and mentally and see the people who were there. I remember that day. I'm married. All right? Whether it was the 10th or 11th, we'll discuss it later. (laughs) But I know I'm married. I know I'm a Christian. Not because I was raised in church. Not because I've tried to be a good person. Not because I've tried not to lie, cheat, steal, and all the other things that the law says we shouldn't do, Ten Commandments. But I know there was a day when I got broken in my heart about my sin. And I realized that what Jesus did those 2,000 years ago was for me today. And I gave my heart to him. I remember praying a prayer. Just, it was pretty simple, Lord. I'm, I don't know what to do. And I don't know how this is going to work. I don't even know what to do next, but I just know I need you. I know I've messed my life up. Would you come into my life and save me? That's pretty much the heart of my prayer. 
didn't have great theological claims and promises and covenant oaths in it. But I knew what, who Jesus was and I knew who I was. If that's never happened to you, you're missing the greatest event of your life. In fact, you're really missing for what you were born for. You were born so you could get to know God, have Christ in your life, know his peace, know his grace, know his joy, know his presence in your heart. I would encourage you today to give your life to Jesus Christ so that you can look back on this day. I remember when he did it. They were having Lord's Supper that Sunday. And that's the day that I came forward and gave my life to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But Paul is making a point to the Corinthian church about receiving communion. He told them, I want you to remember the right way to remember. Remember the right way to remember. See what he means? Because they were coming to the communion table and their hearts weren't right with each other. They weren't right uh, in their lives. They were filled with gluttony and drunkenness. There's all kinds of division in the church at Corinth. And he's speaking to them about all these things. And he's saying, listen, when you're coming to the Lord's table, you're not coming in the right manner. He said, when you, when you do this and you receive the communion together, he said, you should do it in a worthy manner. What, what, what manner is that? It's a manner where your heart is humble and your sins are confessed and you're right with God. That's the manner you come. That's the right, that is the right way to remember to remember. And I'd encourage you today that as you remember if the Lord's in your life, you also remember where you're at. Paul said, let us examine ourselves to see if, you know, can you take a moment to examine yourself? Examinations sometimes aren't fun. When's the last time you went to the doctor for an exam? I listen, that's the one reason I won't go to the doctor. <laughs> I'm one of those guys, like a lot of men are, we just hate to go to the doctor. You know, we got to really be hurting before we go to the doctor. Because, you know, he's going to poke and prod and ask personal questions and get into stuff ain't his business. <laughs> but it is. He's my doctor. He's there to examine me. He's there to help me. You know, that's why some people don't come to church. They don't want, they don't want to listen to Dr. Jesus examining their heart and poke and prod where they don't think he ought to be poking and prodding. Taking our temperature, telling us to open our mouth, and look in our hearts and look down our throats and look in our eyes and check our ears out. All those are good spiritual applications for our life where we let the Holy Spirit examine us. See what we've been listening to. See what we've been watching. See where we've been going. Seeing what we've been saying. What's been coming out of our mouth. Those are good applications. But here's the interesting thing. Is you ought to examine yourselves. Can you be honest with God this morning? Tell him, examine your heart. So that when you come and you receive communion and it's passed out amongst you, you're taking it with a heart that's humble and appreciative and truly remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. As often as you do this, Remember me. And there was nothing more contradictory as what the apostle was saying is having sin in your heart and trying to take the Lord's Supper. It's just, it's, it's opposed to each other. This represents cleansing. This represents revival. This represents forgiveness. This represents deliverance and wholeness. And you say, why would you want to come with a heart that hasn't experienced that and take this? You come to the Lord today. Let's get our hearts clean and get our hearts right. In a moment, we're going to receive communion together. But as we would usually do before we have that moment of receiving communion together, I want to ask you just to stand with me. We're going to give it a simple invitation, a time for us just to examine our hearts and make sure we're right with the Lord. This morning, you feel more than free to step out from where you are and find your way to the altar between you and your high priest, Jesus. Just get anything right that needs to get right this morning. We have men standing here at the altar with us today. You come to any one of us this morning, and we'll be glad to share with you how you can know Jesus Christ personally as your Lord and Savior. Just come, and we'll be glad to pray with you, rejoice with you in your decision. If there's some other need in your life you just want us to pray with you about, come, let us pray about that as well. Some other issue you're dealing with, we'll be glad more, more than glad to pray with you and lift you up before the Lord. But whatever it is this morning, as we worship the Lord, as we sing this song, let's don't have hard hearts. Let's have tender hearts. Would you step out? As, let's respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. Show me. 